All right, great. So welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to have everyone on this call today. My name is Tanya Clayhouse. I am working uh, as a consultant with the Perfecting Democracy Project um, and with the, which is a project of the Civil Rights and Social Justice Section of the American Bar Association. So it's a pleasure to be here being able to do this work. I have been engaged in uh, election protection work for about two and a half decades. I'm dating myself, uh, was one of the originals uh, that was creating the election protection program. So I'm really happy and I believe in this mission of trying to ensure that we are protecting the ballot. And it's a pleasure to be able to work to support that effort uh, through this Perfecting Democracy program. What I'd like to do to open us up is to make sure that I give due uh, uh, honor and respect to the leadership within the Civil Rights and Social Justice section that has been uh, has created this project. And I see who has joined us, uh, the secretary, uh, current secretary of the Civil Rights and Social Justice section, Dr. Cynthia Swan. And so I'm just going to hand it to her briefly to give opening remarks uh, before we begin. So Dr. Swan. Tanya, thank you so much. And everyone, please know that this is going to be a very short opening <laughs> opening remark because I don't I want to get on with the great work that has been laid out around perfecting democracy. I think that uh, we have worked in collaboration and in coalition with so many of you over the years. And to be able to uh, be leading such an amazing uh, effort around perfecting democracy in the space of the ABA and in reaching out and ensuring that we are training the folks on election protection and all of the other efforts that need to happen around voting rights. It's just a wonderful opportunity. So I think that Tanya, she has been leading this effort in terms of making certain that uh, we reach out, that we get as many people engaged, involved, trained, prepared for the upcoming election. And um, I am going to make certain that I don't uh, take up the time that should be focused on that, but it's a pleasure to be here and to um, welcome yeah. all of you. Uh, many that I've worked with before, others, the names I don't recognize, but I'm just so happy to have you. And I know that the, the section of civil rights and social justice okay. is very pleased with your participation. So Tanya, thank you so much. And thanks to all who have joined this call. All right, terrific. Thank you so much. And what I'd like to do is, <laughs> As we um, continue to move forward, I wanted to share with you all, and I'll share um, some of some closing so slides, um, but wanted to make sure that everybody, I said, um, I do think every, oh, I don't think I, um, as I said, everybody will know about the program. And so you all have this information you can always find more information about what's going on and other things that we're doing. We're also posting on social media to provide uh, information about how to, uh, to make sure that people understand what disinformation is and how we're protecting the vote in that regard and making sure that you're getting out to help to get others. Uh, have the Perfecting Democracy website as well as the email you received this information from, so feel free to reach out. And before we end, I'm going to go through, um, I'll re go through this again just to remind you that some of the other things that we do have upcoming through the Civil Rights and Social Justice section, a few programs dealing with disinformation, uh, as well as the state of voting rights. So I wanted to make sure you all were aware of those, uh, these uh, events that are happening tomorrow and Thursday. And also, and you can see the QR codes there and also ways to register. Again, you can find some information online uh, at AMBAR slash uh, in democracy. And additionally, these are programs. Uh, there's been a number of chair chats led by current chair, Lisa, uh, the chair is Lisa Durham. Uh, and there have been chats that have been organized in order to ensure that, again, we are uh, provided the necessary resources and updating people on what's happening in the state of our democracy. 
Again, Dr. Cynthia Swan has been really spearheading these chats. And as you see, there are a couple that I encourage you to really take a, uh, to be, to listen to time with uh, David Hewitt, head of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, and for, you know, who I formerly worked with at the Lawyers Committee in a previous capacity, and also with uh, my friend, also uh, Terry Al, Al Menace with uh, Asian American uh, uh, Asian American Justice. <laughs> this, um, uh, when my a what is it? AAJC, Asian American Justice, <laughs> uh, uh, who made it for justice, who have been uh, really instrumental uh, in a lot of issues, particularly dealing with census. And so I encourage you to listen to those chats. And then again, lastly, just if you have additional questions, you can also visit us on these different channels. So with that, I am going to stop sharing and then I'm going to turn it over to our special guest. This evening, uh, we are excited. Um, I'm sorry, it sounds like people are saying the quality is poor. Can people hear the problem on other people's end as well? I just want to check. It's coming in and out, but I think it's mostly okay, Tanya. Like it just okay. like that last like couple minutes started to get a little bit. Okay, what I'm going to do is have a little bit of turn it over to you, and then I'm going to go on video, and maybe that'll. I don't know if that's the issue on my end or not. Uh, but what I do want to, I want to introduce our guest of the evening, uh, Izzy Bronstein, and she has um, graciously given of her time to be able to speak with you. She's a representing Common Cause, who was a vital partner in the Election Protection uh, Coalition. They are managing uh, so much, not only nationally, but also on the state and local efforts. Uh, they have been a great partner. I've been, had the pleasure of working with Common Cause, again, dating myself for a couple of decades, and so excited that they are be a, able to hear and engage with you and present the opportunities in which you can be involved. So uh, glad to have a new friend here. So Izzy, I'm going to turn it over to you to go off, off uh, video so that you can the focus can be on you. Thanks a lot. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Tanya, and thank you, Dr. Swan. Um, really excited to be here with all of you today and talking about the election protection opportunities that are critically are, you know, around the corners and already happening um, in, our, in all of our communities, really making sure that we're doing everything we possibly can to help voters cast their ballot, make sure all of our votes are counted, and make sure the process goes as smoothly as possible. I'll be talking about the election protection program tonight and talking about ways to get involved, what it looks like in different places. If you have any questions, throw them in the chat. Happy to talk with about anything that you all would like. And yeah, just really excited to be here. Um, so as Tanya said, election protection is the largest nonpartisan voter protection, protection program in the country. Um, in 41 states, there are election protection field programs that are at polling places making sure that voters are, you know, maybe like more likely to counter issues at polling places where we've seen history of problems over the 20 some years the election program has been running, making sure that we are there on the ground for those voters. We also, as I think you all have heard, if you attended the lawyers committee um, chat previously, help support the hotline that answers calls from voters around the country to make sure that we are um, helping voters who are calling us with questions and helping them navigate different barriers and concerns, and then raising those to do advocacy um, and other efforts as we understand what those threats might be. Um, our, our entire goal, as I said, is to make sure that every eligible voter can cast their ballot and have it counted. It's really quite simple when it comes down to the mission. That work has changed a lot over the past couple of years, um, which I'll talk about in a second, but the goal remains the same. We are really honored to be working with organizations from across the country. Common Cause helps lead election protection programs in 26 states, I believe, um, with a variety of partners you know, at the local, community, state, national level. But then in, uh, you know, in, in many, many states, we are simply supporting other amazing folks who are doing this work. Um, you know, you'll, you'll know some of the organizations in your own communities, but also ABA is an incredible partner in all of that. Um, 
in 2020, we had 40,000 volunteers um, with us in the program. I think this year will be a little bit smaller, but like still a massive program with tens of thousands of volunteers across the country. Those are volunteers supporting the answering calls in the hotline, helping voters in the field, roving through polling sites, um, and then dealing with the emerging programs that I'll talk about in a second. So the coalition mission really, as I said, cast ballot really fairly securely. Um, our goal is to make sure we are empowering and supporting voters who have been historically disenfranchised and underrepresented in our democracy. We know where voters are being challenged. It is the same place that they have always been challenged. It's black and brown voters who are will always be challenged in many states. And really making sure that our work is centering the community groups that are working closely with folks every single day and making sure that this election protection work is a year round program. We are not thinking about this just on election day. It's how to make sure that the election systems are built. That comes from doing work at the state level. Um, as all you'll see, all of our election protection programs are led by state organizations. Our goal at the national level is simply to support and make sure we are coalescing all the resources that we have to help support that work. That is for a lot of reasons, but it's part in part because the voting experience is just so different in every state and figuring out what the barriers that voters are experiencing and how those threats are navigated is really different at every state level. When we're talking about, I'm in North Carolina right now, the experience that voters have voting here post Hurricane Helene, especially in Western North Carolina, will be incredibly different than the experience voters will have um, in you know, many other communities across the country. But really being centered in our own communities and centered in our own states helps us understand both the state laws, the you know, policies, the ways that our election administration works, but also the experience that voters have in the history of that voter experience. Um, our core work is really helping every voter doing that education. A lot of what we are able to gather from our election protection work is gathering information about the election systems and the problems that voters face at the polling place by gathering really good data about those problems that they experience and then doing that advocacy and litigation and then election administration at work um, to make sure that we are better preparing for future elections. The election protection cycle, as I said, the election protection program is year round. So in gearing up for the election, we are determining what the problems are in different states, doing voter education as we understand new state laws. Again, here in North Carolina, where we have voter ID for the first time, making sure voters understand what types of identification they need to bring to the polling place with them, and helping voters understand new policies and laws, new ways they can cast a ballot. From there, from understanding the process that voters will experience and the, the needs that voters will have, we build the programs that um, help us under help us support voters so we'll talk about field programs but that also can look like stopping election sabotage misinformation um making sure we are stopping political violence where that um we expect that to happen engaging young voters engaging um, people who are currently and previously incarcerated engaging other voters who may be disenfranchised from the voting experience um either currently or historically um, and then we place volunteers in the places that we know where the problems are most likely to be in the places where we understand where we can best be equipped to help voters. So we recruit folks just like yourselves. Um, the state, amazing state folks train volunteers, and then we put schedule volunteers at shifts. That looks like supporting voters on during early vote, election day, and then we've done this for the past couple of years, but really critically, as folks will know for obvious reasons, engaging um, volunteers in the post-election monitoring process, whether that looks like monitoring audits, the count, the canvas, certification, making sure that we really are monitoring the election process in case anybody tries to challenge it in any way, if, it, if there are any threats that we might know about, and making sure we are stopping those threats earlier. Um, the election process is secure and you know will run smoothly as long as there is not Variety, the variety of threats that we all expect to happen. The best way we can counter those is by being on the ground, being having our eyes and ears at county boards of elections during campus monitoring to understand what's happening and then raise those threats up um, so we can strike to, you know, wash them gently um, before they get out of control. From all that data, from all of that work, we then take that the analysis from the elections and we analyze it. We do a lot of work with election administrators, with county boards of elections, or with um, state secretaries of state to make sure we are helping inform 
people about the barriers that voters faced. In many places, county boards of election, you know, other election administration want elections to go well. They want voters to have their voices heard. So we have really amazing relationships across the country and using that data to help um, the different um, folks who are administering elections make sure they're doing that process well, make sure that they understand the barriers that voters may have faced so that they can help change them for future elections. And then also, of course, doing legislative advocacy. Here's a level of different threats that we may experience in election protection. Um, so, you know, the most obvious ones are the ones that are really easy to deal with. Um, at, at the field, if you all volunteer in election protection, many voters will come to you and say, I'm, I think I'm at the wrong polling place. I was told this, I'm not on the books at this polling place. The easiest way to help and the best ways we can help voters are to help them figure out the place they're supposed to vote and the ways to cast their ballots. Really simple experiences, um, but really, and really easy to navigate. Then we kind of raise up through the levels of what the voter experience may look like. So a lot of times, we're in like un under level three categories, which is that, you know, maybe there's a um, a poll book that has gone down. If one poll book goes down in a polling place, it's normally not a systemic problem. It normally just means that we need to get some a technical um, advisor out from the county to help fix it. But it's really helpful for us to know so we can make sure through our relationships with those boards of elections that we can make sure that happens as quickly as possible. And we can support election administrators in knowing where those problems may be. Obviously, you'll see at level six, there are, you know, some other threats that we all think about, and I think that are maybe more in the news and more what we think about, we think about voter suppression, um, that we want to be prepared for and able to navigate. But really, in most election protection work, we're focusing on the levels one to three. We're thinking about how do we make sure that voters are not experiencing any concerns where they are, we are a helpful set of hands to help them navigate a process that can be confusing. Um, this is a map of where we will see election protection field programs this year. So if you are in a state that is in red, that is a state that has an election protection field program where we are placing volunteers at targeted polling places or to rove around between different polling places to help voters um, who you know may be facing a variety of different concerns. If, there, if it's a state that is green, those are states where we are supporting a process of that, but um, through a like command structure, but mostly navigating concerns through the hotline. You'll note that some of those states are states where that are entirely vote by mail, um, which is just a different set of concerns that voters may face and doesn't really require us to have volunteers at polling sites when they're at polling sites. Um, and then the states that are not in color are the ones that we don't have a field program in. If you're in one of those and you want to get involved, um, I'll throw my email in the chat and feel free to reach out to me. Happy to connect to a variety of kind of different things that may exist there. But if you are in a state that is red, which I'm guessing is the vast majority of y'all, um, as shortly I will show you all how to get involved and how to sign up to be an election protection volunteer. If you are in one of those states, a state lead will be reaching out to you to help um, get involved in the training process. Here are some of the things I will always want to center us in some of the things that we win on. This is how our election protection volunteers help us through the process. They, every single year, election protection volunteers help us extend polling hours. In places where we see polling places shut down for some amount of time for different concerns, they don't open on time, our team fights very quickly to make sure we extend polling place hours and then communicate with voters at that precinct to make sure that, the, that they have more opportunities to vote if they weren't able to vote earlier in the day. We all, every single year, a huge problem in states that have curbside voting is that there's not enough signage and voters who are not able to leave their cars don't know how to do so. How we make sure we get better signage is a critical part of that process. Even if it seems a bit minute, it actually really helps voters understand the experience and not just drive away, you know, disenfranchised and confused. Um, I'll talk about this in a little bit, but definitely de-escalating intimidation or threats we may see from folks across, you know, who are associated with campaigns or associated with candidates, making sure we are calming situations down is a critical part of our work. Um, advocating for language assistance where voters, you know, who are not, we don't speak English, or don't speak other languages where we have um, support, helping get them, people who can actually be um, in a polling place with them or be, support them in the process to get ballots in the language, all sorts of things like that. Um, making sure that voters who are able to cast their ballots are not turned away. I think we've all seen this year, um, voters who don't speak English especially are being challenged 
um, at polling places already for you know accusations of not being citizens that they you know we all know that you cannot vote if you are not a citizen but voters who are trying to cast their ballot um who are then told by somebody or challenged by somebody at that polling place is an incredibly scary experience so being a helpful set of hands and being on the ground as an advocate for them is a critical part of what our ep volunteers are being trained to do this year um, and then stopping disinformation. Um, disinformation is only a threat when it spreads. I mean, disinformation is a threat, even if it's being told between one, two people. But when we really see those concerns is when we reach virality. And the biggest way to stop that is by countering it with positive, proactive inoculation and truthful information about the voting process. And that really helps us stop disinformation in its tracks. As I noted, the election protection program has historically been primarily the hotline field programs, the language lines, really making sure we are in every single voting process. This year, there'll be there are, and in, since 2020, there are a variety of new programs that some states are engaging in, engaging volunteers to be trained and support to make sure we're helping deal with some different threats we've seen. So Stopping election sabotage often looks like monitoring the canvas and certification process, stopping information, being a social media monitor, monitoring social media for mis and misinformation threats and helping stop those. Um, preventing political violence is especially a role that we often have folks who are clergy or social workers or other kind of community leaders help us in um, to help with the escalation between concerns we may say at polling places and be ready to be dispatched as peacekeepers for those situations. Um, and a variety of other programs that may be um, that exist in different states. Just a quick history um, that I wanted to quickly go through with y'all about the health protection program. As Tanya noted, the health protection program has been going on for a you know a, about I guess it's twenty four three years, um, and that history has really been critical in the work that we are still doing. A lot of what we do today is based in our understanding of what happened in the two thousand and one election and elections since then and really continuing to build our work um, upon the, that, that early learning and the learning that we are doing continuously through election protection program. Um, the election protection hotline was a, a critical first part of that, but then engaging our volunteers in the field um, kind of started to expand. We engaged with language lines. There are now three different language lines in addition to the English language line. So the Avota, which is the Spanish language line, the A. AJC line, which is the Asian American Advancing Justice line, which covers, I believe, 18 Asian, Amer Asian languages. Um, and then uh, Yala Vote, which covers Arabic and a couple of other um, languages um, as well. All those language lines started to get added as we started to see those voters call the hotline with, you know, it, who weren't able to, who, um, to be able to speak in languages they were to speak in. Um, the program has just grown in need um, as we all see in 2016, we all know Shelby County, unfortunately meant that voters faced new threats. We wanted to make sure that they were able to have support from the hotline and from other folks to help with that process. Um, and the biggest thing that I want to highlight here is also that in, you know, in 2020, we slipped from the trend of the majority of voters voting in the country before election day. This means that our election action programs cannot just be on election day but really making sure that the hotlines, making sure that our field programs are all available during early vote for folks who are cashing the ballots by Dropbox, vote by mail, that any part of the voting process there, right, any method of voting they're using, making sure that they are um, being supported in that process and any of the barriers they may face. These are the language lines, as I mentioned. Um, I'll make sure that folks have the slides if you want to write them down, but really incredible um, resources if anybody wants to get involved and volunteer with any of these language lines, I'm also happy to connect you with the folks there. They definitely need support and volunteers to help answer those calls. So here are the volunteer roles. As I've noted, um, those roles are determined by the state. So at the national level, there are kind of two big buckets. There are the national hotlines where we have um, volunteers answer the calls. There are rapid response volunteers who both do phone making and texting and um, engagement with election administrators in situations when we are dealing with a polling place, you know, that may be closed and trying to make sure that all the voters in that precinct know that it's been moved. That sort of work happens through a rapid response team. Um, we also have our social media monitoring as part of our um, rapid response work. At the state level, there are um, hotlines as well, and there's also the field programs. 
So some of the, 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 some of the, the big programs there, as I mentioned, are the poll monitors, the roaming monitors, and the post-election monitoring program. Here's a little bit what, the, what those roles look like. Um, poll monitors who are assigned a specific location and they are outside that polling place during the duration of their shift, helping voters um, you know, with signs like the ones in this picture um, and making sure that voters who are having any challenges um, are supported. Roving monitors are assigned a variety of, like, a couple of locations, depends on place, and they're either driving between them or biking between them or walking between them, depending on what sort of place you live, um, to make sure that we understand like that the voting, uh, what the voting experience looks like a little bit. So making sure that curbside voter signage is out there, making sure the polling place is opened on time, making sure there aren't big lines, making sure there aren't police on anywhere near the voting site. That sort of thing is a huge portion of what the roving monitors do. And then the hotline volunteers who are answering questions. Um, field monitors, this is, I just wanna make sure I noted this, this is the biggest program we have. This is the role that most volunteers will be doing. I mean, the, one of the most critical ones we can have. They are ensuring that every voter knows their rights. They're answering questions. They're checking that registration status, making sure voters can navigate any different legal um, statutes that may be in place, and identifying those problems, um, reporting those problems to the command center so we can navigate them um, with election administrators. Um, the hotline overview. Um, the hotline is still taking volunteers, but it. Um, but I believe slightly is starting to is almost done like volunteers where we really need folks is now on the ground. Um, here are a variety of other volunteer roles that exist in different states. I just wanted to share these because as I've said, like we are the election protection program has really changed in its volunteer roles to be from kind of like the initial process of the voting experience. Um, we have volunteers who were monitoring the DNL testing of new machines, making sure that the new machines were working well in places where we have new machines on the ground, all the way to the certification process. Um, and with that, the last thing I have for y'all is how to get involved. Uh, if you go to protectthevote.net, um, source ABA, that means that we can help support you from the Protecting Democracy program. Um, I'll put that link in the chat as well, but that is where you can sign up. If you are in any of those states that were in red on the map earlier, which I can share again in a second, then a uh, state lead will be in touch with you shortly, probably within the next day, to help you get involved in the training process in your state, get trained, get placed in an early voting site, um, get placed in election day, whatever that program needs, you'll be a critical help in the process of that. Happy to take any questions, and Tanya, if there's anything I didn't cover, would love to This is terrific. Thank you so much, Izzy. And yeah, we <clears throat> love to have questions. Anybody, I know that it sounds like the um, the the Zoom has been a little bit sketchy, so maybe everybody didn't catch everything. So I want to make sure that we answer everybody's question and um, make sure that there's um, you know people are able to get involved the way that so they can best can assist. I want to do definitely reiterate um, some, a couple of things that Izzy mentioned about the need for field, for field and poll monitors, how important that really is to reassure voters that they have somebody that is looking out for them if they're having a challenge um, or if they just, you know, oftentimes, particularly in certain states, there are um, two precincts or three precincts or four precincts at a polling place. And as he knows, he's laughing, but it's true. And so what happens is people get in the wrong line, waiting there for an hour to come to find out that they were in the wrong place, <clears throat> long, wrong, and are being told that they can't vote. And so, that, or they have to get in the next line and wait there for another hour. So that becomes an issue. Those are the types of things that oftentimes, you know, people on the ground will help deal with. Because if we find that that's happening continuously, that also can potentially be a cause for holding out, holding open the uh, time for people to be able to vote at a particular polling place. Uh, things like that, uh, having done this in different states for years, it is a, a hodgepodge of things. And I am continually flabbergasted about the variety of things that come about <laughs> when you're working on these that I thought I had already been through, but they are always not ways in which people are have been challenged. So with that, let's go to some of the questions. Um, looks like 
uh, the their um so the first one is do you have descriptions of the volunteer opportunities and approximate time so um it it they, unfortunately my answer to many questions will be it depends on the state um but i'm going to answer this one a little bit more generally full monitoring shifts tend to be somewhere in the range of three to four hours but then we absolutely and oftentimes on election day take volunteers for the entire day um, most voters cast their ballots in the morning and the evening so those are the biggest times that we have a need for full monitoring volunteers we face a number of concerns during the weekend especially on sundays so during early vote on sundays is a huge critical time for many states for poll monitors the other roles um canvas monitoring can take a very long time because we have to watch the canvas process and it is a to be frank long and somewhat boring and tedious process but like that the boring is where the problems happen and so therefore being there for the entire process is in, it's incredibly critical but monitoring canvas monitoring count monitoring certification are longer commitments um, that's my general range. It, depending on the state, I'm happy to answer more specific questions. Uh, the next question, um, uh, says I live in New York and would like to volunteer in Pennsylvania. Is that possible or do you need to volunteer in a state where you live? So you can volunteer in other states. We really recommend for most voter, for vol volunteers voting volunteering in the state that you live. Um, for a variety of reasons, the most being the common being that the voting experience is just so different in every state that it is generally better to volunteer in the place that you were the most familiar with the voting process. However, if you want to volunteer in a nearby state, Pennsylvania to New York is a classic example. Um, my recommendation on the system then is just to put in a zip code that is like close by to where you would want to volunteer. So if you're willing to drive across and go and, you know, to be in the Philly area or Metro Philly, put in a zip code in Philadelphia, and then the Pennsylvania person will be in touch. Um, so that's that. our general recommendation. We don't do a lot of support for folks who are traveling across the country because we are really trying to recruit volunteers who are in the communities they are serving in. However, like for that sort of specific example, if you have family or friends who are in a place that's nearby and you want to volunteer, put in their zip code, and then you can kind of be in touch with the appropriate state lead from there. And I think that answers the second question about zip code is asking who zip code to put in, if we put the home zip codes or if we um, are also open to travel yeah. with those particular the, zip codes. Yeah, the zip code will determine what state, like um, basically the way the process works is that depending on what zip code you put in, your information will flow to this appropriate state lead. So whatever zip code you put in, it will go to that state lead. People in New York would love to have you um, and we'll try to keep you. If you put it in a Pennsylvania zip code, then you'll get it route to the Pennsylvania people. And I think, so the next question is about clarity on when poll monitoring, poll monitoring takes place. I know you referenced how election protection has changed throughout the years where it used to be principally on election day, but now yep. it'll be election two months. Um, and so uh, the question is, does poll monitoring take place only on election day or is it also possible during uh, at early voting, voting sites? Um, unfortunately, once again, it depends on the state. In most states, there are programs during early vote. However, in some states, we do know the biggest threats or concerns happen on election day. That is totally state to state. There are some states where we face the biggest concerns during early vote, some states where we face the biggest concerns on election day. Um, the states where we face the biggest concerns on election day will only be running programs on election day, but that's only a handful. The vast majority of states will be running programs and placing volunteers on shift for early vote and election day. As I said, really encourage you to volunteer if you can on weekends, especially Sundays during early vote. That is an absolutely critical time to have volunteers at polling places. Let's see. Um, person indicated that they signed up to their bar association. <clears throat> and thought there was a particular need for attorneys. Do so you have a need for attorneys generally? Yes, absolutely. So we there are it, we are placing attorneys differently in every state. In some states like Florida, there is a specific program for attorneys. So if you are the follow up questions will say we'll send a survey of are you an attorney, and then for volunteers who are you know attorneys or you know 
law students, then we will place you as legal roving monitors who will be especially assigned polling places that we expect different legal challenges to emerge. We love having lawyers as volunteers because there is a deeper understanding of the different processes of the election system and of the like very, very frank, pretty minute threats that it within the different experience that voters may face. In terms of specific volunteer needs for our lawyers, all of our volunteer opportunities mostly are open to everybody. We just really, we have had the experience of having lawyers in those positions is incredibly helpful. Um, and it's a thing we found through 20 some years of this experience is that lawyers are um, very well equipped at that experience, at, at the process of being in the field. Izzy, if you could also <laughs> clarify, the, this, came, this question came up during the previous orientations with LDF mm. and, and committee. Um, and particularly if people are traveling to a different state, yeah. Uh, about whether or not they have to be uh, barred in that particular barred. state. Yeah. No, um, there are no programs that I know of that you need to be barred in that particular state. Any like any of the actual litigation or legal work that we'll be doing will be handled through the firms that we are working with in that state. So oftentimes it's like connecting with that team to make sure that they understand what you've seen, what you've been experiencing, but it's not you, you um, we would we handle our litigation through the folks in state. Um, but again, if you do have a particular desire to work, for example, within research, work, working on an amicus mm -hmm. brief, working on any um, on, on pre-litigation efforts, mm -hmm. I know that those opportunities still exist. And we also, because uh, we spoke about that during the previous orientations with the Lawyers Committee and LDF. Uh, so I want to just make sure that people are aware of that and we have links to sign up for that still. Uh, yeah, that, the, and, we, the We the Action link yeah, has yeah. all of those. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, okay. Um, this person's indicating they live in Wisconsin and, and signed up to be a poll worker on election day, um, but they're looking at other opportunities to assist before the election. Yeah, Wisconsin's a great example of there are programs during early vote would love to have you um, serving as a poll monitor during um, early vote or helping with that process. Um, and obviously, thank you for being a poll worker. It's That's an incredible way to your skills on election day. Very grateful for that. And the last question I see right now, uh, and this is, and I'm going to, I'm going to get a prior name. Up, I just don't know what state you're in. It's from Gail. Uh, and indicating that what she's entered her information, but it, sh it doesn't show any training dates or opportunities. So I don't know what state yeah. um, you entered in, Gail. Yeah, um, California. Gail, um, the California program is doing their trainings through a slightly different system. They are emailing at people every day. So you should get an email tomorrow with the training opportunities. They're just not gonna show up on the, the site itself. That's partially because the program in California is split between AJC who runs the program in Northern California and um, excuse me, in Common Cause who runs the program in Southern California. And in Virginia, it's a similar situation. They're sending out the trainings every day, um, but they're coming through a slightly different system. So they won't show up on the portal, but they'll be emailed to you tomorrow. So if, if you're finding that in a state, um, then that'll be the, the case. Okay, so we just got that question about Virginia. You just answered that, thank you. And, um, and Gail, did we answer your question about the legal opportunities? It, it should come directly from the entities on the ground, is what Izzy was saying. So if, so from AJC or Common Cause California, from where you are for or warden in or in Virginia, they'll come directly. That would oh, Izzy, is that correct? I think that Gail's actually asking about the We the Action link for the LDF and Lawyers Committee. Oh, so okay. I'm yeah. that wrong. Oh, is that okay. Okay. I, I, don't, I, I, could, I could be wrong. That's how I read that, but I'm not sure. All right. So yeah, I will resend in addition after I'm going to send out the information that is presented today for signing up. And I will also be sending out the other links for the other opportunities with um, that lawyers committee and LDS spoke about. And everybody is working together. I want you to know that this is all part of the grand election protection coalition everybody has just had to 
where they're splitting up exactly how managing stuff because there's so much work to be done and because things have evolved throughout the years that it just takes a lot in order to make sure that we're able to prioritize, the organizations are able to prioritize what's happening on the ground. Um, oh, and I did, so, and, and, I, yeah. and I apologize, I wanna make sure I'm clear on that point because Tanya, I realized something as I said that, that last yeah. question. Um, Lawyers Committee is like slowing, is slowing down their recruitment for yeah. volunteers. But I believe is there's still opportunities. I think they are just closing in on their training. So definitely encourage you to go to that way to action link quickly. Is that right, Tanya? Yeah. So it's my understanding actually that the lawyers committee closed down their hotline for vol the, the volunteer on September 19th. Because so because we had um two orientation, we had an orientation before then to try to make sure that if anybody who wanted to get into that could. And then I sent out another link. I will, I'm going to follow up again to, to just to verify, but I know that that's always a, a high, um, you know, people really, you know, wanting to do that. Now, is it, but is it, is, are, but there are the, the state hotlines that are also coordinating yes. too, right? So, absolutely. So in, it depends on the state, some states go, their hotline goes directly through lawyers committee. But in some states, they run their own hotline on the ground as well and make sure they answer the calls actually from the community. Um, so once you sign up to be a volunteer, then you will kind of get funneled into the system and, and they will offer you the different trainings that may exist. If there are trainings for folks to run the hotline, that will be on the site. Um, and then the post, oh, I'm sorry, Tanya, I, I'm now just yeah, reading the chat. Yeah, okay. go right ahead. Um, the post election opportunities for lawyers, what are we? highly encouraged. In many states, we only allow people with legal experience to monitor the count or the certification because it is such a detailed process. Um, and we need people who understand to, how to look for detail and in the um, in the system and listen in as the counting certification is happening. Um, if there are count certification monitoring programs in your state, that you will start to get emails about that if you sign up to volunteer. Um, and they will name if those are for lawyers or legal experts only. Perfect. All right. I think we have gotten through all the questions that the people have put in the chat. Um, let me do a last call, see if there's any additional questions that people might have while we're on this call. And again, if you don't, if you have something further afterwards, feel free to reach out. You can email me directly and I will respond and try to make sure that we can get the information to you. We will be following up with links. Uh, you have the links that uh, Izzy has provided and we'll follow up to make sure you all have that through the email as well as the other links for the other organizations that are coordinating through election protection. Okay, all right. And so for those um, that also have friends or colleagues that weren't able to join today, are, are interested, we wanted to announce and let you know that we will be doing another one of these orientations on Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern. And so I we will, um, I believe that we already have the public registration available for that, uh, which is right here. And I'm going to drop that in the chat right now. So if anybody wants to send that around to anyone who wasn't able to say no was able to today, I will be sending that out separately as well. So if you see this, uh, again, if you, you don't have to join, it will be the same, be the same uh, presentation, but we wanted to make sure that this information does get out. We will have the recording available. And again, feel free to contact us and contact us with any additional questions. So with that, I want to thank you. Thank you to Izzy for your, taking the time this evening. Thank you to everybody, everyone else who's joined the call. Please let others know that we are desperately in need of volunteers uh, to make sure that we are protecting the vote. The, the need has expanded and it's, I'm so glad you showed the evolution of how things have changed throughout the years. I've had it in my head, but actually to see that on paper uh, was something to, um, Wow, it brought back memory. So to really see how things have changed, but also how we are having to do things all throughout the time and that you actually now have people, more people voting prior to election day than on election day, which is really something, a huge change. So we encourage all of y'all to get uh, to get involved and we look forward 
uh, to being talking with you. All right, you guys, everyone have a great evening. And thank you so much for joining on behalf of the Second Democracy Project. Take care. Bye, everybody. Thanks all.